you. Good afternoon. You know, I was shocked. I was coming out of the garage and heard my name being called. This is a special day today. A day that was ordained since the beginning of time. I do not believe that there are ever any accidents in where we are to be supposed to be. Is this okay? And I thought about when Barbara Trader and Haley came and asked me to come, what could I really talk about? What could I share that would make a difference in the lives of the distinguished people to whom I'm speaking today? I had no idea that I would be addressing a room full of people with PhDs. <laughs> I, I was shocked when I came in and they said everyone in there has a PhD. And I said, really? So please uh, bear with me. I'm a little nervous speaking to so many people with PhDs. And some of you might say, no, I don't have a PhD. And I believe that you do. You have to understand what PhD stands for. Professionally handling demands. And if you are professionally handling demands, you have a PhD. And so it's good to be in a place where so many people with PhDs are here. And I feel at home this morning. I feel right at home because most of my adult life I've attempted to break down many of the barriers that you face in your lives. The rights of people to have access to education, housing, inclusiveness, employment, and a better life in general. It's good to be in a place where the real uh, level of awareness and the sensitivity to others is pulsating and so high. Some of you might be excited to come to Atlanta. If you're like me, when I go to conferences, I'm glad to be away from home. <laughs> glad I don't have to make up my own bed. Glad I can get with other people who are just having a time and maybe in the evening drink a little Coca-Cola. <laughs> Since this is the Coke capital of America, have a little Coca-Cola and just have fun. Talk to people about all of the challenges that we all face. And it's good to get away and be in a place like this. I'm thrilled to be at a conference where people are concerned. Not one where you just come and say, we came to a conference, we went to the vendors, we saw each other. But where you come and you're stimulated to leave this place differently. I want to thank Barbara Trader and... Haley Kimmett and Ralph Edwards, who I had an opportunity to speak with, and a man that I hold in very high esteem here in the city of Atlanta, Mark Crenshaw, who handles many of the programs at Georgia State University with persons with disabilities. Mark is a good friend, and we talk a lot and travel a lot together. And I don't know whether he's here now. I don't think he is, because when I talked to him, he said that he would be with students today. But I want to thank all of you for allowing me to come and share a moment of two with you on this conference. And I like your theme. I really like it. No excuses, creating opportunities in challenging times. As I read this powerful statement over and over, I felt as a preacher, I needed to change the title for my delivery. Uh, it's one thing for somebody else to have something and outline it, but I want to speak from the theme, making a way out of no way. When you don't know how you're going to make it, when the mountains are high and the valleys are low, and nobody understands you, making a way out of no way. Uh, how, how do you make it when deep down inside your very spirit and soul, you feel that all hope may be gone. How do you keep going when the road seemingly has come to an abrupt end? How do you keep climbing when the mountain peaks seem unreachable? How do you pull up uh, out of a deep valley of despair and desperation and doubt and at times depression? We've all been there at one time or another in our lives where we wonder is it worth going on. 
I, I, I just want to stop today and, 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 and walk away, but when you come to a conference like what Tash has put on, and as I begin to read about Tash, 35 years of history uh, as it supports the needs of people with disabilities, I was humbled and greatly impressed when I talked with people and read about the tireless, thankless, sometimes misunderstood and poorly appreciated work that you often do. One of the things that I believe when you work like you and like I trying to bring people into the mainstream of America, it is a thankless task and often underfunded, underfunded. Now maybe most of you have all the money you need to do what it is that you do. We don't. But that's when the spirit of the people have an understanding that there is nothing that we cannot achieve when people of common goal, of common mind, come together with an undying spirit that we will speak truth to justice. We will stand for righteousness and we will stand for those that are constantly being put down because of either race, gender, sex, or a disability. You are working daily to stop abuse, neglect, and institutionalization of some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And no group is better to do it than those of you who are assembled here. You didn't come here just to be at a conference. You didn't come here just to say, I went to be in Atlanta for a few days. You went here because iron sharpens iron. And when people of common bond come together, there is a certain resilience. There's a certain strength. There's a certain way that you hold your head. There's a certain way that you speak up for those that can't speak. There's a certain way that you stand for those that can't stand. There's a certain way that you tell and tell them we need to be funded all across the board. And when we do that, you understand that all of us that are here today that are concerned about breaking down barriers and changing misperceptions and enlightening the uninformed and the miseducated, there is something that must be down in your very DNA to be an effective agent of change. You must be concerned. You must be caring. You must be committed. You must be compassionate. And you must be competent. Don't give in. Don't quit. Don't turn around. And don't make excuses when the time gets tough. Don't make excuses when the challenges are rough when no one seems to care about anyone else, when funds are limited for what's really important, when those who have been on the battlefield fighting for inclusion communities, for those with disabilities, don't quit, fighting for those who are wounded and beaten and battered and weary, and you want to rest, you want to quit, you want to give up. I wanted to do it many times in my life. Have you ever felt like there was no way out of your dilemma and you decided to make excuses to blame others to have a pity party or just give up find a corner and go someplace and pout i've learned one thing now nobody comes to pity parties anymore <laughs> nobody cares about your pouting anymore nobody is listening to our excuses anymore because they're so full of excuses. I have and at times still do wonder why am I standing here before you today? Not me, not Gerald Durley, not Gerald Durley, Mrs. Durley's son, standing here in the Atlanta Hilton in 2011. What gives me the right to be standing before you a young black man born in segregated times to a 16-year-old mother. A mother that wondered, 
I didn't plan to be pregnant, but I was impregnated at 16, and a young man standing before you who flunked the kindergarten. No one flunks the kindergarten. All you have to do is show up, shut up, and eat your graham crackers. But they kept me behind in the kindergarten. And the reason that they did was because I had a severe stuttering problem. I could not get, get a word out. And, and they wondered, well, he's a little slow, Mrs. Durley. So they kept me in the kindergarten for t t t two years and then put me in EMR classes and labeled me educationally, mentally retarded. I'm talking about 19... <laughs> I don't know if it's changed that much in 2011, 2011. But they put me in the class and... Then my brother next to me, Leander, came, and they always labeled me Mrs. Durley's slow boy. And they gave me EMR classes, and sometimes they would mainstream me with the rest of the classes. But there was a lady named Mrs. Aslan, and maybe she was like some of the people here who are attending this conference. Maybe she's a person who had the kind of virtuousness of a task. person. She came up to me and said, you, 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 you can do b b better. You don't have to, this is my teacher talking. You don't have to stutter if you just b b b believe. And I, I thought, I, at that time, I th th thought she was a f f fool <laughs> because she was stuttering, telling me that I didn't have to stutter that if I breathed appropriately and relaxed my diaphragm, I, I could do it and be like the other children. Of course, it was just talk. But one day she came, and it's amazing how when you least expect something, because for the first four years of my life, everybody said, that's Mrs. Durley's slow boy. You know, she was a teenage mother, and he, he, he just stuttered a lot. He's a nice kid. He never gets in any trouble. So they looked at my behavior, but they told me that. And you know what? When somebody tells you something long enough, you believe it. And I, I believe that maybe, maybe I, I could not meet the same criteria as my brother Leander, who was a year younger than I. And so I reacted the way that they told me. I was boxed in. They had put me in a box, and I closed the door and locked it. And I saw myself as the person in the EMR classes moving ahead. But Mrs. Aslan said, I want you to come to my class and speak to my class. And I said, for what? I don't get up and speak. And overcompensating for the behavior, I developed an inappropriate attitude. Some folks call it a quick temper and a salty mouth. I just said I was just attitudinally deficient at the time. But anyway, I went into her class and I stood there. Very much I'm like standing before all of you today. And she said, speak. And I said, and nothing would come out. And as you know, many of the children began to laugh Children can be cruel when they don't understand. They don't mean to be that way, and so can adults be very mean when they don't understand. And they all laughed at me, and I stood there, and I don't remember exactly because that was in the fourth or the fifth grade, but I do remember saying something like, oh, all of y'all, kiss my butt and leave me alone. <laughs> and I felt good. I felt real good. And she ran up, Mrs. Adler, and said, you see, 
you, you didn't even stutter. <laughs> it's interesting how we can place people in boxes, how we can institutionalize them, how we can make certain kinds of references. And isn't it interesting, that was like 1958? No, 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 1950 or 51. And it's interesting now, all of those people who put Mrs. Durley's boy in the EMR classes, said that he probably would not finish high school, said that he could not put his thoughts together. It's interesting, all of those people now, many of them are dead, and I'm making my living speaking without stuttering. That's what you can do when you make a way out of no way. Certainly there are times before I get up and today might have been one of those times. In fact, I was here at 11 and went down into the garage and I just prayed that, and, and it happens so often, is this the day that maybe you'll result, resort back to 40 or 50 years ago? But some kind of way when you have that, 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 that belief and you work at it and others are encouraging you with a strong support system and that's what TAS is about, what you're about as you go to your various places of work and pick up information here, how to go back and encourage. And then all of a sudden there's a new kind of resilience in you, a new way that you look at yourself. And you don't have to make excuses. You don't have to blame other people. All you can do is understand where I am, who I am, and what I'm about, and I'm going to do it regularly. Enunciating words. I remember I used to sit and say, I am going to do that right now. And they laughed at that. And I was trying to speak without stuttering. We get into those boxes so many times. And I look back now, standing here, making no excuses, speaking without stuttering. Why? Because a few advocates who wouldn't be quiet during a time of multiple forms of segregation of a young African-American man in the 50s. So today I join forces with you today declaring that None of us will stop our work of creating communities of inclusion until all of us have equality and a better way of life. All of us are in this together. The disabilities movement and its advocates are very similar to those of us who were in the civil rights movement of the late 50s and the early 60s. Our cause, as is yours, was just to be fairly treated with equal rights and accessibility to housing, human rights, transportation, education, and voting opportunities. We were denied our constitutional liberties based upon the color of our skin. It was discrimination in its worst form placed on Americans who were born here, worked here, paid taxes here, and fought for the country, yet were systematically excluded from what the Constitution said we deserve. Constitutionally excluded by the laws that God said that we're all created equal, regardless of color, race, gender, sexual orientation, and or disability. We knew somehow down inside that we were not three-fifths of a person. Regardless of how you are tempted to be boxed or put in certain areas, you know who you are, you know what you're about. It's not about what's on the outside, but what's on the inside that will make you who you are. Too many of us make excuses for a limb here, a limb there, a brain damage. And, and, and in reality, we are bigger than all of those things. Yes, these are just words, but words constitute actions and belief systems. They say seeing is believing. That's not true. Believing is seeing. I can touch this podium because somebody believed and now I see it. When I see an airplane going through the sky, I do not see an airplane. I see the end product of the Wright Brothers' belief system. What is it that you believe that you can accomplish? What is it that you believe that you can occur? And believe me, I'm not sitting here trying to be a motivational speaker. Believe that. I am not. I tried for years to motivate my son to pull up his pants. <laughs> a 
a wasted project. <laughs> but you can inspire people to motivate themselves. When you get their own deep down DNA of who you are, then you can motivate yourselves during these challenging times, very challenging time, giving now challenging people at every corner for better opportunities, those during these challenging times to fight for equitable treatment of all people during these times, just give me a fair shake. During these challenging times, we would not only achieve if you just opened up the door and you never know what's going to happen in your life at any given moment. Right now, there are two word ways that you spell time in Greek. One is chronos, the other is kairos. Chronos means that I'm scheduled to speak here at 12 o'clock chronologically. But there's another way to tell time that I think moves all of us who are advocates for the inclusion of all persons with disabilities. It is called kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, which simply means that we don't have all of the answers and we don't know why we're in a place but if we're in the right place for the right reason, with the right purpose and the right people, the right results will come forth. That's Kairos. So today, we're here, as Martin used to say, inextricably woven into a fabric of humankind. I never thought Mrs. Durley's boy, who flunked to kindergarten, who spent the first four or five years in EMR classes. I never thought of finishing high school, but because I was blessed with a few basketball skills, we went on to college, and the freshman year there at Tennessee State University, uh, there was a letter that went out. The year was 1960, 51 years ago. So figure out my age. Yes, I'll be 70 my next birthday. And I'm still standing, not stu stuttering all of the, the time. And I went down there as an 18 year old, six foot five, 135, 165 young African American with an afro then. <laughs> and they said, there are five gentlemen coming to speak here at Fisk University. And I stood there. And I, as an 18-year-old, wanted to go down to Fisk University because they had some of the most beautiful, intelligent ladies. <laughs> Tall intelligence, short intelligence, smiling intelligence. So as my roommate, we went down, we went down to see the intelligence of the Fisk ladies. <laughs> and the back door opened. You never know when you come to a conference like TASH or conferences in your own state chapters, what's going to happen when you go in with an air of expectancy, an air of awe, an air of this might be the moment, the Kairos moment that will change my life forever. I walked in, I'm standing there, and I said, oh man, this is great. <laughs> my one roommate 6'9", the other 6'8", I was only 6'5". And I said, this is fantastic. Fantastic. Then the back door opened and five men came in. And I said, uh-oh, it's getting ready to get serious. Two of the men were my same age. Two of them were uh, 10 years older and the other was 11 years older. The two men my same age, one's name was John Lewis. The other was Julian Bond. The two older guys, one was Andrew Young and Hosea Williams. And the other little guy in the middle was Martin Luther King. And I'm saying, what do they want? What have they got to say? We're here to enjoy the intelligence of Fisk University. <laughs> what did you come here to get? What did you come to Atlanta to perceive and receive? And they began to talk 1960 about the situations at the Trailway bus station, the colored drinking fountains, the white water, Greyhound, Trailways, movie theaters, 
and they said, we're going down in March, and some of the people from Vanderbilt came over. I'm 18 years old with one goal in mind, not to stutter again and to go and play professional basketball and buy me a brand new red convertible Pontiac. My goals were clear, but sometimes your goals might be clear, but you come to a conference like this, something is said, something is uttered, somebody reaches over and touches you, something grabs you a certain way, and all of a sudden, at that Kairos moment, your life changes changes forever. You find that you're really on a mission, a thankless mission, but one that has been put in your life to do. Yes, it's tiring. And I got in the movement then at 18 and went to jail over 27 times and all of that. The kid who they said was an EMR wouldn't make it. And then finished school and because I was so intricately involved, uh, I had to leave America and move to Africa for two years. From there to the all European team, you won't be able to translate what I'm getting ready to say now. Because I thought it was all over and coming back to America, but because of my involvement, when you believe in something, when you're an advocate for something, when you're a champion of the cause, when you're trying to challenge us legislators about what we need to do, the resources we need, sometimes you run into opposition. So I had to live in Europe for a year and a half. Ça, c'est le reason je parle en français très bien maintenant. Parce qu'avant, toujours avec mes amis, je parle en français là-bas. I told you you couldn't translate that. <laughs> I had to learn the French language. But you know, when you get in your most difficult, challenging situations, if you don't make an excuse, God has a way of just saying, you can make it. You can make a way out of no way. You can come from the bottom to the top. But there is something that you've got. And to believe in that day, my life was changed. This might be the day that your conference has changed. We didn't make any excuses for being born the way we were. No excuses for the racial barriers which were placed in our path. No excuses for the blatant ignorance of those who didn't understand what we were enduring and had to face daily. No excuses for unfair laws of segregation and discrimination. No excuses for being isolated from the mainstream of the American life. No excuses for being last hired and first fired. We made no excuses because God does not make any mistakes. Whatever God has put in your path, you don't make an excuse, you grab it, hold on. If he can put you there, he can get you out. Tash, and those who have committed to this conference, your time, your talent, and your treasure, to this movement at the 36th annual conference, you must, if your goals are to be met, you must unflinchingly, unapologetically, unswervingly stay the course. What does staying the course mean, dearly? It means that you will not become so discouraged to the point that you give up. I didn't say feel like giving up. I feel like giving up every time I get up. <laughs> but there's a difference between feeling like giving up and giving up. You will feel that way often but remain focused on advocacy, research, professional development, developing policies and information for parents and families, build viable networks among other groups that feel the same way. That's why I admire the Wall Street movement. I don't know if they know what they're talking about, but at least they're together saying it as one strong group, 99 against one. Standing there, having that kind of strength inside. Be specific and intentional in your efforts not to exclude the plight of those who have traditionally been excluded because of disabilities and race. Tash and conference attendees, I will encourage you during the challenging, conservative, racially divisive times in which we face now, do not have fear. Do not discriminate among persons with disabilities. Do not inadvertently place young African-American children in special education classes as they did to me. Do not do it. It is so easy 
When you see a child acting out a certain way and all of the riddling that they put in and a child is coming there and they're acting a certain way to medicate them. Stop that. Put the nurturing effects in. Put the awareness in. Bring those young parents in. Challenge them in that way rather than just isolate them and do not fall guilty to it in any way encouraging anyone who might be a little differently to drop out of the system or drop out of the education and tell their parents don't drop out either I, I, I know that I'm speaking to the choir the movement is strong and like the civil rights movement will be long it will be hard it will be a struggle I asked C.T. Vivian, Andrew Young, John Lewis, a friend of ours, Joe Lowry, just got the Medal of Honor from Barack. And we were all there, and Joe was getting ready to speak. And they still consider me the kid on the block at 70. <laughs> Joe Lowry's 90. C.T. is 86. Andy just turned 80. And, uh, so, and how do I know that they considered me the kid? They said, dirty, go get the water. <laughs> and I got the water. It's going to be a long struggle, but we will achieve our goals because our mission is right. Our mission is just. I challenge you all today to have high expectations of what it is that you're doing. You've been called to this movement. You might have thought you came for one reason, but there's always something greater than you moving and guiding your footsteps, your mind, your lips, and your heart. Years ago, there was a man who was a chicken farmer and he had taken some chickens over to his son's house. And his son called him and said, Dad, uh, we have, we have uh, been looking for the chickens you dropped off, but the latch came off and the chickens ran all over the neighborhood. And we were only able to catch 12 of them. And his father said, well, that's good, son. You caught 12 of them. I only left you six. What do you expect to catch? <laughs> if you expect to catch six, that's all you'll get. Set your expectations high. Believing is seeing. Make no excuses because I believe in this room today, as I take my seat, that all of us can fly. All of us can soar above whatever the challenge, whatever the disability, Whatever the criteria, we can fly. I'm not an ornithologist nor a bird expert, but I'm told that an eagle can fly 100 miles an hour. I'm told that an eagle can look down three football fields and see a quarter. I'm told that an eagle can spread those six-foot wings and fly high above its challenges. I'm told that an eagle can reach down with those mighty talons and pick up a small sheep and carry it up to its nest. I'm told that when an eagle faces a storm, it turns away from the storm and flies and then turns back to that storm and faces it head on. The story's told. Is that a sign for me to stop? Oh, no. The story is told. See, I, I don't care. I'm like a preacher. I say, I'll be through in a minute. Um, <laughs> but this is it. The story is told about a young man who was a farmer. And this farmer raised chickens. And all of his little chickens were so pristine. They graduated from Chicken University. <laughs> all of their feathers were just right. They spoke appropriately. Everything was right for the chickens. But then one day the farmer was walking down the road and he found an old beat up egg, dirty, filthy. And he looked at it and he said, maybe I'll take it back among my chickens. And he said, no, no. He, but he did. He took it back and all of the other people said, oh, look at that dirty, filthy egg. Where did it come from? Who, who the egg mama is? Who the egg daddy is? That egg looks like a welfare egg. That egg looks differently than most of us. Why are you bringing that filthy egg among us? After all, we are from Chicken University. 
So one of the old hens sat on the egg, and the egg popped open. And when the egg opened, the bird came out. The bird's beak was crooked, the eyes a little cross, long arms, bow legs, and feathers on one arm and none on the other. And everybody laughed at that ugly, crippled, distorted bird and laughed. And so they took the bird and put it over in the corner and fed it chicken feed regularly. And the bird ate the chicken feed, ate the chicken feed. And the others had a great time. But one day, a person came by who had just attended the Tash Conference in Atlanta. <laughs> Looked over in the chicken yard and said, excuse me, Mr. Farmer, that crippled, distorted, strange looking bird over there, why do you have it in the corner? Well, it's just, we, it's not like the rest of us. It's different, and we keep it over there. He said, but do you see what that bird really is? He said, what do you mean? No, it's just, look at it. Look at how it's built. But look at the bird closely. Do you know what that is? That's an eagle. Hmm? What? An eagle. That's nothing but an old bird that we found. But it's an eagle. You've got to look. Look at that bird. No. He said, let me talk to the bird. So that very sensitive, caring person who was fighting for those with disabilities said, come here, eagle. Come here, who? Come here, eagle. I'm not an eagle. I'm a chicken. You're an eagle. You are a strong, regal bird that can fly 100 miles an hour. You're an eagle. Say you're an eagle. I'm a chicken. <laughs> say you're an eagle. I'm a chicken. Sucker, say you're an eagle. I'm a chicken. Come here. I want you to fly. I want you to make a way out of no way. I want you to show all of these other people that you're just as good and better because you're an eagle. Fly! He said, what? Fly. They never told me I could fly. They told me I was just a cripple sitting over here in the corner and they fed me. You start believing you're an eagle. You come from good stock. You're an eagle, say it. I'm a chicken. Say you're an eagle. I'm an eagle. Now fly. He started running and he levitated. And he started to fly. And the farmer and all of those others, they said, look at him. He believes he's an eagle. That's stupid little crippled up bird. And they threw some little mess down on the ground. And the bird came down and started eating it. But that Tash conference attendee went over and said, come here. Don't you ever go back and take and eat that slop again. You are eagle. You come from good, good stock. Don't let them define you about how you look on the outside and your arms like this and your knees and your beak crooked. Say you're an eagle. I'm a chicken. Say you're an eagle. I told you now. I am an eagle. I am an eagle. And when he said it the third or fourth time, his legs got straight. His eyes got clear. His, he saw himself differently. His wings popped out. The, wing, the feathers began to come out. He said, now fly. And then he flew up over the, up over the whole chicken yard. And they screamed, and he looked down and said, from now on, I don't care how you see me. I see myself as an eagle, and I'm making a way out of no way. Thank you. Fly! Soar! Go up! Don't quit! Be an eagle! God bless you. Oh, yeah! And I'm still standing. <laughs>